Why do you need a gun? It is one of the most frequent questions posed by anti-gun people. Pro-gun people will argue that it is needed for self-defense. Then anti-gun people argues, then learn how to fight, you do not need a gun, learn martial arts, use a bat, blah blah. Then pro-gun people say, but you cannot fist fight against a thug with a gun or a knife. Anti-gun people respond, you do not have to worry about thugs with guns if all guns are banned, and if thugs attack with knives, then you can stop them with a knife. For most people in USA who are pro-gun, the idea that a person should be forced to only use a knife in self-defense against a thug with a knife would be an absurd idea. Reasonably so. However, maybe to your surprise and dismay, in most part of the world outside of USA and also within the anti-gun population in USA, the idea that a person acting in self-defense should only use level of force or a weapon that is equal or less than that of an attacking thug is quite common. In many foreign countries, people may think it is wrong to use a gun against a thug with a knife. The delusion of this sort was apparent in comments made by people of other countries that I spoke with, and also internet comments posted by foreign nationals, especially talking about matters of use of guns in USA. And even among pro-gun people in USA, even though they may know such idea is absurd, many of those people may not be able to explain why that idea is absurd. So why do those people have that absurd idea? You need to note that even most of those people who are anti-gun will claim that they believe in right of self-defense. Some may be lying, but most probably genuinely believe each individual has a right of self-defense, but not a right to use a gun. So what is it that they are thinking? If you look at their argument, you will see a pattern. Even without guns, you can still fight with fists. Even without guns, you can still fight with sticks. Even without guns, you can still fight with knives. Do you see a common theme here? The absurd idea is because of wrong definition of self-defense, and this is part that even many pro-gun, pro-self-defense people commit an error. Right to fight is not the definition of right of self-defense. Right of self-defense may include right to fight, but right to fight alone is insufficient for right of self-defense. So what is the correct definition? Right of self-defense is right to stop infringement or damage to rights under liberty. So what is the difference between right to stop damage to rights under liberty and right to fight? Right to fight means just that. You can fight, but it does not matter if you win or lose, and it does not matter what damage you receive. More to the point, it is not concerned with whether if your right of liberty is protected or any justice is done. That is the idea under which many countries and cultures force a person to only use nothing more than a knife and self-defense against a thug with a knife. You may receive equal or even more damage while being forced to use equal level of force while defending yourself against a thug. Right to stop damage to rights under liberty means more than just a right to fight. It means you have a right to refuse any damage while defending yourself against a thug. So in order to effect that, you have a right to use more force than your opponent even if it means your opponent can receive more damage than you. That is why you have a right to use a gun to shoot a thug threatening you with a knife. There are at least two main reasons why anti-gun people have a delusion that a person acting in self-defense should only use equal or less force than the attacking thug. One reason is simplistic, and the other reason is quite serious. Let's address the simple reason first. The simple reason is simplistic mindset resulting in lack of understanding objectives and a mind that is also prone to irrational projection. Prime example is this. When asked why a person acting in self-defense should not use a gun against a person with a knife or a bat or a superior number of attackers who the defender would not be able to resist without a deadly weapon, one of the common answers I received was that it is unfair, meaning unequal in terms of level of force. This is a mind showing ignorance of what the objective is. The purpose of fighting in self-defense is not giving an opponent an equal opportunity to win a fight. There is nothing fair about a person unjustly attacked, receiving the same damage as a thug doing wrongful harm. 
The purpose is to refuse unjust harm, whether if the force used for that purpose is equal to that of the opponent is simply irrelevant by logic and reason. Another problem is irrational projection. For simple-minded people living lives mostly insulated from violence, the closest thing in their lives that has any resemblance to violence is sport fighting. Giving athletes equal opportunity to win by giving equal environment with the winner only decided by their difference in skill and will is a part of the goal of a sporting game. That sort of mindset is even reflected in popular culture movies, even ones depicting violence where a protagonist purposely gives an opponent in a disadvantage a more equal chance to fight against the protagonist in a dual sort of setting, which is often not a reflection of reality. However, to project that mindset to a fight for self-defense is an idiocy. The correct idea of self-defense is not about whether if level of force or weapon is equal or not. It is not about whether if the level of damage each party got is equal or not. It is about stopping damage to rights under liberty. The reason you have a right to use a gun to shoot a thug who is trying to break your leg with a bat is because you using higher level of force or weapon is irrelevant, and that the level of damage the thug receives being higher than the damage you may receive a broken bone is irrelevant. What is relevant is that you have a right to stop that thug from breaking your bone, and that gives you the right to use enough force to stop the unjust damage to you while defending yourself. So the standard of justified force is about whether if the level of force used is reasonable to stop the harm, not whether if that force was equal to that of the opponent. This is also the reason you have a right to use deadly force under disparity of force doctrine, such as using a gun to defend yourself from serious injury or death when your opponent outmuscle you or your opponents outnumber you, even if those opponents are unarmed. Anyone can try to fight any opponent with just the fist if that person ignores whether if that person will succeed or not, or whether if that person will live or die. However, some opponents will only be stopped by a weapon capable of deadly force, such as a gun. The goal is to stop the damage, not fight. I have heard anti-gun people talking about fairness, justice, or being civilized while they talked about their anti-gun stances, while they obviously had no understanding of any of those concepts. The idea of civilization is using experience, reason, knowledge, and tools of technology to overcome problems, heading towards enhancement of human life. Each person may have a different opinion about what that better life may be, but going against liberty would not be consistent with it. A person using a tool such as a gun to better protect oneself against a wrongful attack of thugs is consistent with civilization. When a person is forced to fight against a wrongful attacker with equal force and receive equal damage, there is nothing fair about it. There is nothing just about it. There is nothing civilized about it. Forcing a person to fight against a thug's wrongful attack with equal force and coercing equal or even more damage to satisfy an ignorant sentiment of a political majority is what is truly barbaric. When a person is forced into a fight against subjugation under restrictions of a society that makes the fight futile against thugs who can outmuscle or outnumber the person, that condition cannot be recognized as a state of liberty under the standard of intelligence and reason. That absurd condition is exactly what societies that define right of self-defense as merely a right to fight impose on its people. Let's go further and examine what creates this difference in attitude between USA and many foreign countries. It is also the difference in attitude between pro-gun people and anti-gun people. The conclusion that I have arrived is that the foundational difference is individualism and principles of liberty versus collectivism and populist ideology. In USA, the right of self-defense and liberty is recognized as an individual right. However, I realized that this is not the case in most countries, including most of the so-called free world countries such as Europe and some developed Asian countries such as Japan or Republic of Korea. If each individual of any of these countries is asked if they think liberty and right of self-defense is an individual right, most will probably reply yes. And most of them probably genuinely believe that is their political belief. However, very often their actual political actions indicate the contrary, especially so in foreign countries. 
they actually show an attitude and belief system of collectivism. If you line up individuals from USA, UK, France, Germany, Japan, Korea, and ask if they value liberty, freedom of speech, etc., probably all of them will claim they do. They will cl all claim their country is a so-called free country where individuals have rights. However, when you get into details, none of them will completely agree on what constitutes basic liberty rights. And people outside of USA will exhibit far more willingness to accept individual liberties being taken away if, if it is the will of the collective. Probably all of them will resist the idea of a single individual tyrant taking rights away. However, some cultures, some societies are quite willing to accept those rights being given or taken at will by a tyrant consisting of 51% majority. For example, in USA, an expression cannot be criminalized only because the majority of the population feels emotionally offended by it. However, in Europe, Canada, or other UK Commonwealth or Asia, apparently majority opinion resulting in criminalizing a certain expression can be done in a far wider range of circumstances than in USA. In system of liberty and individualism, whether if something can be banned it depends on reasoning about how that something affects liberty. How many people like or hate that something is irrelevant because freedom to do that certain act is a right of an individual? However, in system of collectivism and populism, an individual is a mere subjugated subject of the collective. The will of the collective decides whether if something is free or not free to do, and the reasoning behind why something is allowed or banned is irrelevant. Only thing that is required to allow or ban something is simply the will of the collective, and the system does not concern itself with the reasoning or why the collective wills it. While most of the population of the so-called free world countries will feel repulsed to the name collectivism, those people's actual political behavior reflects collectivism's ideas without those people realizing it. This is because collectivism disguises itself with a friendly face and manifests in a way that most people lacking intelligence do not recognize. In my childhood, when I was told about totalitarianism or collectivism, I was made to think of images of people madly cheering in Nazi rally with the Hockenkreuz flag in the background or image like a mob expressing rage towards whatever the Ingsoc party told them to be raged at in movie adaptation of George Orwell's 1984. However, how collectivism manifests has a more friendly face. When people demand a law to take away certain freedom, and the reason given is nothing more than that the majority wills it, the will of the majority itself is the justification, then that is collectivism. However, rather than saying collectivism or totalitarianism, so many people readily accept the idea as just when it is expressed as democratic or will of the people. They might feel repulsed to the name collectivism, but not the idea of it. While not all systems of democracy are collectivist or totalitarian, a type of democracy not restrained by constitution of principles of liberty certainly can be. Whether if a society or a country is collectivist does not depend on whether if there is a crowd of people cheering for a Hock and Kreutz or overtly oppressive dystopian 1984 type society. It depends on whether if will of the many itself is allowed to be a self-sufficient justification of infringement on individual liberty. Not realizing this, so many people demand more mob rule politics based on populism, with political system moving more and more towards that direction, but each individual within those mob feeling more and more oppressed while not realizing they are their own oppressors. This difference in attitude is reflected in how each society or country treats right of self-defense and right to own and use weapons. In United States, self-defense and right of owning and using weapons such as guns are treated as an individual right. An individual being told that the individual is only allowed self-defense using non-lethal force and if a harm cannot be stopped by non-lethal force, then the individual should just accept the damage, even death cannot be recognized as a system of liberty in any sense of reason. So what an individual has a right to do for self-defense depends on whether if it is consistent with logical necessity of liberty. 
The question is whether if the object of consideration is a logical necessity of liberty, if the answer is to the affirmative, then it is a right, and how many people like or hate that right is irrelevant. However, in a system of collectivism, right of self-defense or right to own or use weapons is the domain of the collective. What an individual can or cannot do for self-defense is decided by whatever the collective feels like allowing or forbidding, depending on public sentiment, populism. Under that system, whether if an act forbidden by that system results in an individual unable to defend that person, even if such prohibition makes no sense in terms of that person's basic liberty rights, is simply irrelevant. So an individual being told that the individual should just accept being killed or maimed against an opponent who cannot be stopped without a gun is possible in a society of collectivism, if that is the sentiment of the collective. To a collectivist society in which the political majority emotionally feel repulsed to guns, that majority feeling safer without guns is more important than whether if an individual's fundamental liberty rights are preserved or not, regardless of whether if that perception of safety is reality or not. Not all societies or countries with collectivist attitude totally ban guns. Some of those countries allow ownership or use of guns, although with far more restrictions compared to USA. However, that is only because that is the sentiment of the political majority, not because those people recognize it as an individual right fundamental to liberty. Just like those societies allowing freedom of speech to a certain extent only because the sentiment of the political majority allows it, not because those societies define freedom of speech as an individual right that should not be arbitrarily taken away, even in the name of the collective. In more serious case, some political groups are knowingly and willingly anti-liberty collectivists. To those people, individualism is their enemy, and individual having a right that cannot be taken away in the name of the collective is a threat. So individuals having a right to use a deadly weapon to protect their rights at those individuals' own decision is probably the most serious insult to their ideology. This is why the collectivist, emotion authoritarian, or people often described as left-leaning constantly, tries to take away right to own guns. Not only are they against right to own and use guns or other weapons, they are anti-self-defense rights. If you look at political demands or bills proposed by legislators of that type of political ideology, it is not limited to restricting weapons. It is about oppressing right of self-defense as an individual right. So we come back to the first question. Why do you need a gun? Because you have a right to use deadly force when needed, not merely trying to get an effect with fists, sticks, or knives. You have a right to use deadly force in sufficiently effective form to actually effect a stop to wrongful serious harm, even against thugs who may outmuscle or outnumber you, and the ability to do so is foundational to liberty. This biological necessity means that you have a right to tools and means for its success. Mere right to fight for liberty is insufficient to secure liberty. It must be accompanied by right to have means for effective and sufficient force. Right to liberty is not limited to merely pursuing it. It includes effecting it, by deadly force if necessary. To all this, anti-gun, anti-self-defense, or fundamentally anti-liberty people will decry willingness to risk killing for liberty. They will ask, should society be willing to kill for liberty? One thing is certain, a society that values not killing anyone over liberty cannot maintain liberty, because there inevitably will be thugs and subjugators who risk their lives to destroy the liberty of others, and that society inevitably has to surrender liberty to avoid killing them. That society takes away liberty of people not to be harmed when those thugs risk their lives to harm them, forbidding using deadly force to stop the thugs when that prohibition will cause harm to others. This damage to liberty is not limited to only a minority who faces a small number of criminals. We saw a major city in the United States surrendering its areas to mobs to avoid deadly confrontation while that mob self-appointed themselves as government acting like tribal warlords and ruled over people. 
We see politicians saying laws should mandate people to retreat from criminals to avoid force being used against criminals when those criminals are violating other people's rights under liberty. A fundamentally defective idea, protecting thugs while potentially turning innocent people trying to defend themselves into criminals. That is the consequences of trying to save all lives at cost of sacrificing liberty. It is fundamentally irreconcilable with maintenance of liberty. I hope this information is useful to all liberty-minded people. See you on the next episode.